All right. Okay, hi, good morning everyone. So I'm Ariane from Ethos Books and welcome to the launch of Singapore Opera. So it's been a while since we've had a physical event and actually more than a year since we've been back to the Arts House. But now we're in the Blue Room uh, today and we'd like to thank the Arts House for the venue support for this event. So thank you to everyone online for joining us uh, online and in person today. And together with uh, Nasri, we would especially like to give a shout out to the amazing contributors to Singapore Opera, some of whom are with us in the Arts House today. And we really appreciate that we are, we really appreciate being able to come together today during this time. And we are looking forward to celebrating the launch of the book today. So if you have any questions for the panel, both, uh, both those in the art house and online, uh, you can post them on Slido throughout the program. So the Slido link is up here. You can just go to Slido and type in uh, hashtag Singapore Opera and you, bring, you can ask your questions there. Uh, so you'll find the link on the slides uh, on Facebook Live in the comments and also in our live uh, note-taking document. All right, so now I'd like to get the launch officially started by introducing our moderator for the program, uh, Siti Hazira Muhammad. Hazira is a culture enthusiast who believes in the redemptive power of words in affecting social change. So a graduate of the Malay Studies program at the National University of Singapore, uh, she is particularly enamored by the ability of alternative narratives in allowing us to reflect on and question everyday lives and lived experiences. So Hazira, please take it away. Thank you, Erin, for the generous introduction. And thank you, um, everyone, for being here today. It's so wonderful to see a live audience. I have Zoom fatigue, honestly, and I've stopped tuning into live stuff because I always fall asleep at the 10 minute mark. So it's always great when we can be together physically, even during these challenging times. So um, also, thank you to Nazri for editing that has allowed us all to be here today. So quick introduction, we have Nazri here with us today. Nazri is the editor of Singapore Apura and also one of the writers, we will grow him on that, or one of the writers in a short story in the volume, we will grow him on that later. Uh, also live, we have Diana. Diana is the writer of um, Transgression, also one of the stories in the volume. And interestingly, because of circumstances, being what they are, we have Hassan who was supposed to join us physically, but he's unable to. However, we have managed to get him to beam in in true speculative fiction style on Zoom. So yeah, Hassan. Oh yeah, I must always remember there's a five second lag. So if you all see us like, awkwardly looking or like there's an awkward silence, we're actually waiting for the lag to pass before Hassan can respond. So Hassan, if you can hear me after the lag, can you wave? Wave. <laughs> Was that a wave? Was that a wave? <laughs> I guess that was a wave, right? Okay, we've tested this out. He can hear us, but I must remember to be slower. Okay. So, just... Yeah, jump. I, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, okay, but you didn't wave, so we didn't know. Five seconds left. Five seconds left. Okay, he can hear us loud and clear. I think the audience is also able to hear him. I mean, the live audience. And speaking about realities, hopping on to Diana, how did Nazri approach you and, 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 and you know, be seeing your work categorized under specters of CH, right? How did that make you feel? Um, I think Nazri emailed me. <laughs> That's how he approached me. I think, uh, I, I forget already. <laughs> um, for CH, actually, I don't know. I, 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 I was thinking about it. I mean, my story transgression to put it very short it's it's a story about a hum it's about a human man who had a baby with a bunyan woman so it's kind of a very typical malay speculative fiction there's a lot of these kind of stories that have already been made so i wanted to make my own version that kind of also jumped off the Ulet Mayang folk tale um, that, that comes from the state of Terengganu and has its own ritualistic dance as well. Um, uh, as for it being categorized under specters of Seher, I was also like, hmm, does it really um, fall under that? Actually, Seher, what would be its, what would be a good translation for that word? Yeah. 
sorcery. <laughs> so yeah, magic yeah. sorcery. Magic sorcery. Yeah. And yeah, it has like a kind of. Um, would it be fair to say there's a kind of like a negative connotation as well to it, right? You can, you can, yes. you can also say it's mystical, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I think in in the present context, yeah, yeah. It, the, the, it can be viewed as sort of uh, negatively, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, um, with Islamization, lah. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You said it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that that's another thing. I guess it, in a way, my story was trying to also look at that, like how do these traditional, old standing. Uh, rituals and folk tales. How do they get viewed in the present? I mean, they were seen very neutrally for a long time, but then because of Islamization, then how they are viewed is very different. So, um, for it being categorized under specters of sihir, I guess in a sense also, the story is still meeting up against that tension. If it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely transgressive. Yeah. As a play on your title, so. Five second leg, Hassan. <laughs> how did Nazri approach you, and how do you feel uh, when your work is with your work being classified under Tech Baru? Let's all be patient for five seconds. Yeah? Slower. Okay. How did you feel? Uh, Nazri approached me when uh, I was. Uh, doing uh, i think the story was written in 2011. how did nazri approach so, you so to be categorized it as a tech under tech it was it was good because it was something new uh, when i wrote it the when i when i wrote it social media wasn't that uh, very rampant. It was it was still at its infancy, and then uh, the idea of having a smart tombstone is, is isn't is something new. So so now when you look at it with all the technologies and coming up, and if you go to Google, uh, I think there's a news in Turkey whereby they have a QR QR code. On, on a tombstone itself where they will actually show your life history, your pictures and whatsoever not just by scanning your QR code. Someone can know your entire history when you are born until the day you die. Okay, I guess that's a cue for his dying, right? Okay, so going back to Nazri, right? Uh, in your in your afterward, you wrote you you talked about decolonization, and you mentioned uh, the bicentennial, right? Uh, I want to point out that you also contributed a volume during the bicentennial, also published by Ethos, called "The Myths of the Lettered Native." Of course, this is again a play. Eh? We can see that Hanajri is very punny, right? Uh, it's a play on the myth of lazy native, right? But I mean, coming from it from a critical perspective, right? By contributing to that volume, are you also not contributing towards the bicentennial narrative? And so, is this volume then, you know, in, in, in a context where last week the most privileged Chinese man in Singapore said there's no such thing as Chinese privilege in this country, right? Is this book then, Nazri, a form of redemption? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that question, and I've thought about it. So, my honest opinion about the bicentennial campaign is that uh, it's a very uh, it's a campaign that has some good aspects and some not so good aspects. I like the aspect of it trying to look at modern history of Singapore, starting from the year uh, 1299, going back, going back beyond the official narrative of 1819. In the uh, in you know, taking into account Singapore's very uh, strict bureaucracy, I think that's actually a win. In, in, the, in terms of official narratives. So, um, so I was, uh, the reason why I decided to participate in the campaign, even though I have some reservation about other aspects of it, such as the impermanence of this narrative that I just spoke about. So for example, the four other statues that came up, I, I, you know, you, we can argue whether these four were actually representative in the first place, but the idea that there, were an attempt, there was an attempt to try to recognize other pioneers than Raffles is, 
It's a, it's a good move. I think it's a welcome move. Except that it then afterwards disappeared, right? And we are now back to that Raffles statue just standing outside here, still looking down on us, right? So uh, that, I, that part I don't agree. But the reason why I decided to participate in the bicentennial campaign is because I think that you know, it's important to also try to make your voice heard within official narratives. Uh, and the way I tried to do it was to you know, focus on that pre-1819 kind of history by looking at uh, the Sejarah Melayu and its uh, symbolism in there. So, uh, so I see this work as an extension of that, minus the kind of official bureaucracy working. Right? So I would say it's both an extension, but also a kind of small critique to, towards that. It's not small, not because I think that I'm tr trying to be careful, but because I think you know, this work is one of many that can critique um, you know, uh, the official narrative. So, so that's what I say would be my answer. Then maybe you are smart mamat lah, right? Because you took the resources to write Myth of Lettered Native and then you went on to write this book. So I guess there's space for multiple or contesting narratives even within the same person. Lah. Okay, so uh, moving on, I want to give this uh, moment for a brief shout out to, the, uh, to our artists who designed the cover. So maybe we can look at the cover now. Don't you think it's amazing? Right. You know, because people say don't judge a book by its cover, don't bluff. When you go to like, when you go to bookshop, right, the first thing you'll be like, whoa, what's this? And, and the cover is it's amazing. I think the artist is here today, right? Uh, Muhammad Izdi. Yeah. Are you here? Hey, there he is. Yeah, can we, right, really, it's amazing. Oh no, my people fell. So you go by Lepak Lukis on Instagram, right? Lepak Lukis? Yeah, I went to check it out. But the most, uh, informative aspect of the cover, right? It's on page 194 of the book, therefore please buy the book. There's an explanation like to the different uh, symbols in the cover. So yeah, buy a copy, understand the thought process that went into the book. And he somehow incorporated like all, almost all elements of the stories on here. I like the cable trees, you know, I never noticed the cable trees. What's the most uh, like, What's the thing that jumps out at you the most when you first saw the cover, Nazri, and then Diana? I like this idea of the tiger vomiting water, which is a kind of play also on the Merlion, I suppose, yeah, I, which is really quite interesting because, of course, when um, you know, the story goes that the, li the lion was actually not a real lion, right? It might be a tiger, right? Mm. So that's, uh, that's quite interesting, yeah. Diana? I think uh, the hands in supplication, la. Mm -hmm. I think, which is based on Hassan's story. Yes. Yeah. You read page 194, Diana. Good job. No, not yet. Oh, you did I it? just got the book today. <laughs> <laughs> it's in my author copy today. But, but yeah, it's, I think it's, it's um, well, it's the most obvious thing, but I think it's a, in the first place, Hassan's story has a very interesting premise. And also, I think more books should do the thing where they actually ex explain the intent of the artwork like um also if you look through lepak lukis instagram account he also did this post where he explains like the thought process for the um the the art the book art is very interesting and i recommend everyone to look at it yeah yeah we give footnotes huh yeah Najri, you wanted to add oh, no i say this is like the bonus 14th story right i feel yeah. Like that I didn't plan for at all, but it came like a you know, pleasant surprise actually. Yeah, very cerebral. They say Malays are lazy. Uh. Hello, we went extra effort. Publisher asked for 13 stories, we give 14. Uh. And then we even detail it on Instagram, right? right? Yeah, I would ask Hassan. Hassan, which, which aspect of the cover really, um, really jumped at you when you first saw it? I, I like the the, the 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 supplication with the two crystals. It might be of matrix. You choose either one of it, whether you want to stay in reality or you want to go into the science fiction aspect of it. Yeah, nice. Okay, I know it's awkward to like that five second lag, but I feel like if Hassan his presence is here, right, we must include him. So the thing you must know about me is I'm the kind of person go big or go home. So today we will have a lot of five second legs and that's okay. So a short also shout out to Ethos, right? For providing a home for, for Malay, Malay narratives in Singapore. So I have here a copy of um, Malay sketches, right? Uh, which is in some way speculative too. There's a, I was telling Nazri just now, I love this story about uh, Hantu Tete, right? The story is about Hantu Tete, right? But actually, 
sebab a lady who found out that she had breast cancer. So, it's really and this was launched like right next door on 31st March 2012. Like Alfian signed my book. But, you know, in some ways, right, this feels like a continuation of the tradition, but with a younger and also a stable of authors, of course. This was Alfian's, you know, he's he's the individual writer. So, thank you Ethos for always providing a home for Malay stories. Hey. English Malay stories, ah. Huh? Must acknowledge the other people who also previously published in Malay volumes and now you've translated the stories, right? Okay, so we will move on with Diana. <laughs> uh, you can go to the next slide. So now we'll, we'll specifically move on to Diana's story, Transgression. And we've prepared something. Uh, Diana, you can sing or narrate, but sing lah, sing lah. Okay. You know? Yeah, why not? This is your stage. I, I didn't know Imagine it's a Malay out. wedding. Then it's like, ah, siapa nak nyanyi? Who want to sing? Okay, uh, go. Okay, well, this particular verse um, describes the, what the, well, I mean, this, uh, should I explain the story? Okay, so, the Ulik Mayang folktale tells the story of a fisherman who was pulled under by a sea princess, or, in the Bunian world and she so there was like a ritual that was done to try and retrieve his soul back because his body is in the human world but his soul was not in his body so there was this ritual that was done and when the ritual was done like different prince the the healer came across like different princesses until finally the final princess says okay, like those who are of the human world return to the human world and then those who are from the sea return to the sea. So it's a folktale that that in its essence also talks about this um, transgression between like worlds and how at the end the balance and harmony was retained by everyone being in their own place, um, in their own respective worlds. Um, yeah, and... Basically, my story looked to uh, kind of like jumped off this folktale and looked at how, what if this harmony was not uh, retained or it was only um, put back much later when maybe there was a child. And yeah, so Hazira was like, cute. <laughs> yeah, I'm obviously delaying singing the song. And <laughs> Hazira was like trying to ask, like, how did you come up with a description of? the the being like the sea princess so to speak in the story i didn't i didn't name the bunian woman as a princess necessarily um yeah and i mean certain descriptions were from the song itself but also general descriptions that have been given by people who say they have seen uh, orang bunian um yeah so okay now i have to say i got i cannot talk anymore already i got nothing else to say <laughs> okay so um this part is the second verse so he goes, um, Putri dua berbaju seru, Putri dua bersanggul sendeng, Putri dua bers, bersubang gading, Putri dua berselindang kuning. Alright, wonderful floor! I mean, it takes a lot of courage to sing. I, I, I practice in the shower. <laughs> Like Malay wedding, right? Any random uncle. Hey, I want to sing that song. Cue it up. But yeah, then I, I, and of course, the, the translation is the description of what the princess was wearing. I wanted you to sing it, right? Because, you know, we wanted to play the background music, but I guess in the, in the Zoom, blah, blah, last minute thing, we forgot. But it's okay. The melody is very haunting and evocative, right? It's like, you know, and there are people who say this story is like, this song and ritual itself is, like berhantu, right? Yes, when people yes, watch exactly. it, like they get. Yeah, actually, like, it's very to interesting to to, yeah. to read about it because um, uh, there are people who say actually the the current lyrics of this song has been like changed so that its power is not like there, so that it can be retained as like a piece of heritage. They can perform it and stuff. Mm -hmm. But even then, um, they even when they perf when dancers perform it, they omit like the last verse, which they say is like where a lot of the power of this song lies. Yeah, and it's, yeah. I think it's interesting. Also, this, this part about Slendang Kuning, the yellow scarf, some people say actually it's like Slendang Hijau. And actually, it depends on where the 
background is they said so because the princess was at the sea and the sand is yellow so then it's sinang but if if it's like the background is like a forest and then the song changes then it's sinang hijau so yeah i think it's i mean part of the mistake of this kind of things is the fact that the purity of it has been changed so that's part of the mystery like you did not you are not left with the real thing right like and so that's part of its mystery i mean that's what people say about the quran also like the I, the real quran is like we've got we are only getting like a secondary version so to speak yeah yeah and it's, it's interesting you brought hijau we brought up hijau because hijau actually also brings me like reminds me of the story like ni roro kidul I don't know what if also a sea queen, right? A Javanese sea queen, and and there's so much like parallels in in the Nusantara region, and I, and I think Nazri, you brought that up also in in your afterward, right? That you know this Nirokidi is also a sea queen, and there's also a mis there's also like a mystical element where people say there's a hotel, like someone created a hotel this Nirokidi, yeah, and, and she comes. So when I was preparing for this um, for today, right, and I was listening to. And, and specifically, Diana brought up Ella's version of, of, um, of, of the song. And I don't know whether you know Ella, but she's this like... Ratu Rock. Ratu <laughs> Yeah, but it's interesting because I came across this video where she was like, do it, do it, gedi. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to say gedi. I don't know how to describe gedi to you, you know. It's like, fl- fl- flirtatious? Like Christina Aguilera. <laughs> Christina Aguilera, yeah, like, like the Angmo equivalent is Christina Aguilera, right? But it's so interesting because it's such a traditional song. And then she's like a ratu rock, you know, like known for like, yeah. but then in, in her album called Symbiosis, and that's interesting, right? She actually performs this song, yeah. but rockified it. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, this is actually a drawing I found by, by, by an artist on Deviant Art, right? So, yeah, so that's the, Nilena, you, you want to explain? I have to explain this, I don't know. It's an anime version. What, what do I explain exactly? <laughs> Really no, this is the story, lah. You know, it's oh, basically yeah. a spirit who who, who 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 enchanted a fisherman, and then it originated from Trunganu, right? And we know Trunganu is on the coast, yeah. and therefore, therefore, the, the the ritual is actually meant to separate the fact that the fishermen were enamored. I guess in some ways it's about Malay's coping mechanism, also, right? Because when you go fishing, people get lost in the sea, right? And part of dealing with trauma or grief is to come up with an explanation to how could they have been lost. Maybe this is like, you know. Coping with grief or trauma 101, right? The Malay style coming out with Yeah, her. actually, I mean, uh, folk tales, like, uh, they tend to respond to certain very fundamental anxieties, right? So, in a sense, it, it, there's a lot of similar stories across cultures. I think the Japanese also have a similar story of, uh, of a fisherman who was pulled under by a siren. And in a sense, this is also the story of someone who pulled down by a kind of siren. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And finally, I really love the play of light and shadow in your story. It's also mirrored in Norida's story called Second Shadow, right? In some ways, when I read your story and then I read Norida's story, it was like similar but different, right? But the idea of light, shadow, wayang kulit, I think it really permeates through. So thank you for sharing with us this slice of your reinterpretation. Okay, next we can move on to Hassan and our five second legs. <laughs> So Hassan's story is Hassan there, yes. So before he catches up with us, right? I'll let him tell his story. But this is actually a picture of a Boston Dynamic dog at Bishan Amokyo Park. Have you guys seen it? It's like really creepy. It tells you to socially distance from each other. I've also seen the robot at PLQ. They have another robot, Paya Lebar Quarter. And the robot like patrols. Like I was walking, right? Minding my own business. And the robot came and like, uh, stay. The I kick the robot cannot very expensive. Later, there's camera. But basically, uh, they are here. They are already here. In case you think this is fantastical, they are here, guys. Not to be scary about it, but they are here. So, Hassan, maybe you would like to share your thought process behind uh, doa.com. And then you also mentioned just now briefly the tombstone, right? Yeah. How, how has it changed or how has things remained, it became even scarier uh, many years after you initially wrote the story? Many years, uh, when, when I initially wrote the story, uh, technology was still developing. But then uh, one of the stories was that uh, 
with the introduction of technology itself, it will make our work much lighter, much better. But however, as what we can see now, uh, with the coming in of technology, with the introduction of technology, we see that it is much lighter, but it requires lesser people. And then that, that's, that's where you read the story. One of the, one of the lines is that you have a minister saying that you need to embrace technology. You need to, it will help with your, with your work, with your innovation, uh, lighten your load. But then what we are seeing now is that with, technology, with the introduction of technology, you see that we are, we are seeing work get cut out. Uh, people getting retrenched, uh, replaced by technology itself. So I think one, one of the positions you can see that uh, technology itself is a double-edged sword. Uh, it, it can help you in a way and it can also bring a bit of uh, what I can say is a, a bit of sadness to those uh, uh, sadness, stress, anxiety, especially in this kind of uh, uh, conditions. Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's for me lah. That's my thought process. I love the ATM aspect of the story, right? Because it really brings in commodification of religion. How doa is like transactional. You can buy the doa and preload it. And what really struck me at the end of the story was that the Pachi gave the protagonist uh, an old dog year like version of the, of the doa book and asked him to read. Then immediately bring back my weekend madrasa days, you know. I used to bring the buku, right? Then you memorize, dua, then your ustazah test you. But, but one thing that really got to me, right, was that he said he couldn't read Arabic. And the pakcik said, uh, read it in your own language. Lah. It's fine. So, Hassan, do you want to comment on that? Is that a commentary on like, Arabization of Islam, commodification of religion? I think when I read it, one of the things that really I want to bring across is that uh, not everything that's Arabic equates to Islam. Uh, means especially their culture, uh, some of the, some of their practices, culture, cultural practices, okay. and 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 the the other thing that I want to bring it now, if you look into this context. With the with the introduction and uh, of social media and the activeness of people on social media itself, we shouldn't be too uh, uh, gullible for with towards someone who wears uh, wears a scarf, wears an Arabic uh, juba, uh, or or, uh, or the, the the cloth over the head with a beard. And then recite a couple of Quranic verse or a couple of hadiths without understanding the context, and mm -hmm. we are gullible to what they are seeing. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need to know what is the actual context of it. Yeah, so we shouldn't be gullible to to these kind of uh, things online. But yeah, that's for me. Yeah, and it's scary, right? Because with the Taliban, with what's happening now, the Taliban is now media savvy, you know. They know how to manipulate the media, present an image. And there were actually news about Malaysian, celebrate, Malaysian politicians celebrating the fact that Taliban is back in power in Afghanistan. I think you can criticize America without praising the Taliban. Huh? And it's, it's very complex. And, and right now, especially when people in such uncertain times like pandemic, that's why people look towards certainty, right, Hassan? Oh my God, this is really disorienting for me. You know, it's like, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, I look at Nasri and Diana, but I know I must look at Hassan. But he's not responding to me in real time. It's five seconds left. So maybe this, this situation, right, is a, good, is a good example of technology can never replace humans. Right? It can never. Because while it has enabled Hassan to join us, it's like a simulacra of a, of a real conversation. So it's really double-edged sword, lah, like it says. <laughs> Should I move on? It's just too weird. Thank you, Hassan. You can laugh at me, five-second delay. 
Next, we move on to Nazri as author. So, Nazri, you have included yourself in this anthology, in your story, Tuju or Seven, right? So, I read this uh, review by Stephanie on QL QLRS, where she said that, you know, she looked askance at an editor including his own work in the anthology. So, Nazri, I already preempt them that I'm going to put them in the hot spot today. <laughs> That's what you get for choosing me as your moderator. <laughs> so, but I told him I'm going to put him in the hot spot. Why include yourself? And what do you think your, vo what do you think your voice adds to this anthology? That couldn't have been yeah. said by somebody else. Right, right, mm. yeah. Thank you for asking that question. I think it's actually very important. And I actually agree that I think... Uh, yeah, editors including their own story is, you know, raises doubt, right? And uh, so I just explained that the, the, the way the structure of the, uh, the whole book was that we were looking for, I mean, I was looking for uh, stories that were new and old, uh, but in the form of the short story. And in particular, while I was researching on short stories already published by Malay writers in English, there were very few of them. And the ones that I found were actually... Uh, the result of a screenwriting workshop that had uh, seen the involvement of not just myself, but also Bani, who's here today, and also he's at the back. Thanks for coming, Bani, and also uh, Ila, uh, whose stories, if you read, are very good. I think excellent stories. Yeah, and I'm I'm really quite blown away by those stories as well. So, because of the nature, there were uh, writers who were writing speculative fiction in English, but in the novel form, and it's very hard to pr produce that in, in this one. So I thought to present whatever I can find, which was uh, Ila, Bani, and myself. So that was a... Uh, I mean, I could have not included myself, but I, so I guess now I think about it, I don't know, it's just uh, 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 maybe something that I should have done not to, right? Uh, but at the same time, I think one of the critics that I've s criticism about that story that I see is that it's a very difficult story to read and that I maybe should have included content warning about this, uh, what, what this story was about because other stories did not go the way of gore or, or violence, right? Whereas my story really, like, you know, goes straight on into that, right? So, so I, I think this is something that I, uh, thinking back, I should have included maybe, yeah. Although I'm still thinking about the... Whether, it's, uh, whether stories should include content warning or not, I'm still thinking about that, but I, I can see the merits of actually including it. Um, yeah. I mean, since we jump ahead to gore and uh, graphic, uh, I thought that if I was going to be traumatised, <laughs> then I should traumatise the whole lot of you also. So unfortunately for me, right, uh, I mean, your, your, your character uh, commits murders based on paintings. Right? I mean, like, in, in the scene of a, of a painting. And it's kind of like, what, Da Vinci Code? Uh, right? Da Vinci Code? Yeah. 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 But <laughs> you've offended that I compare you to Dan Brown, is <laughs> it? <laughs> Formulaic, 101. But anyway, <laughs> I have seen these paintings, unfortunately. So when I was, and I didn't expect Nazri to write like that. Because, you know, my image of Nazri is like, academic, very, uh, huh? smart mama. <laughs> Smart City. Actually, he said Smart City also in the book. Yeah. I, I, I like that better, Smart City. But yeah, Smart Mama. Then I read this book, I'm like, oh my God, is this what Nazri said on the inside? It's kind of scary. But <laughs> these are the paintings, right? Yeah, these are the paintings. So we have uh, National Language Class on our bottom, on the bottom, on our bottom, <laughs> on the bottom left. We have Epic Poem of Malaya on the right. And then the final murder that was going to be committed is in the uh, form of Afandi's reclining nude. And you know, it was so interesting for me because I went to the Afandi Museum in Jogja. Uh -huh. And then I saw like such, not pastoral, but you know, he, he had a painting of Ibu, which I love. Because the expression on, you can Google Afandi Ibu. And then the mother's face is like my mother's face every time she has to deal with me doing like things Malay girls are not supposed to do. But then when I, apparently it's one of the rare news that he did in red. So, yeah, maybe share with us. Why these paintings, Nazri? And, and, and of course, National Language Class and Epic Poem of Malaya by, is by Chua Muiti, right? Uh, Chinese, yeah, from the Nanyang, Nanyang School. Yeah, so maybe you can share a bit with us about that. So, um, the story is actually about hidden violences, right? In, uh, I mean, you, you can interpret it on your own, but the, when I was thinking about writing this, uh, because of the prom, the prom was write a story about 
uh, stray nanobots. So I was thinking about how, and I, I was very, uh, very influenced by Ishi, Ishiguro's uh, Never Let Me Go, which is actually a science fiction story that focuses more on the human aspect rather than the, the technological aspect. So I wanted a story that does that, uh, where the technology is maybe uh, just a, an element of it instead of the, at the forefront. And so I was thinking of, uh, and uh, you know, I'm a big fan of a big fan of true crime. Actually, it's a guilty pleasure, which is the actually the theme of, uh, you know, uh, SWF this year. Yeah, but but so I was thinking of writing a story that uh, that talks about hu hidden violences. I don't want to hide that even within the Malay community, there are violence that happened within, right? And some of these violence have no answers, and in fact, is incomprehensible. Right? And, so, uh, and so that's why maybe there's a lot of that happening in this story. And one, that's, that's the basic, basic part of it. But at the same time, on a more, I was thinking of a more abstract level, is this very idea of the pursuit of beauty in art, which is actually a, a very violent process. A, a violent process, uh, so the, the definition of art in an artist's mind takes place as a hard-won battle in, a, in a, maybe an arena that we don't see, but it happens in, within the artist's own minds, right? And sometimes to pursue that idea of beauty or aesthetics, right, is to, is to actually, you know, uh, give up and in fact put into peril your own relationships and sometimes Afandi himself, if you look at his, uh, you know, uh, biography, you can see that there were a lot of things happening there. He went through a lot of turmoil and, and struggles, you know. And also the, the, the very, to, to get to that his perfect idea of beauty, and I think artists will never be satisfied. I'm, I'm not saying that all artists are like this, right? Uh, with the end product of it. So it's, it's really to show on an abstract level this kind of, to materialize a battle that is immaterial in the mind, to show in the form of a crime fiction, but at the same time also to show that violence happened. There are hidden violence, hidden violence of several things that are peculiar to Singapore. Uh, such as uh, I brought up a little bit of that notion of meritocracy uh, within, uh, and so so that's that's the motivation. Yeah, you brought up santan itu setan. <laughs> I laughed out loud. Santan itu setan, and which means basically coconut uh, milk is the devil, right? And for Malays who are cued into this sort of narratives, right? Just recent, again, same most privileged Chinese men in Singapore saying Malays have attained progress in education but need to work harder. And there was a very disturbing report about trying to explain why Malays are overrepresented in normal technical stream. I was like, uh, Lee Zubaydah Rahim answered that question in 1998. Yeah? Why we need to commission another study anyway? Uh, and, and study design was of course problematic. But that aside, right? Nazri, did you, when you wrote this book, like, right? I mean, when you wrote this story, right? And... And the idea of santan and excess. Did you worry that... Okay, when I read it, I was like a kid in a candy shop. Like, eh, 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 Nazri wrote this. But did you worry that people did not get it? Or, or did you write it specifically for a Malay audience in mind? You know, if you are Malay and you've lived through these hidden violences, right? Where, it, In fact, I would actually say that the real monster is meritocracy. You know, in, in terms of how the dynamics of how the characters interacted with each other. Did you, did you specifically code it for a Malay audience or was it like, uh, what, what have you, you know? If you want to know why they say santan is a you have to go and find out that campaign about kita cukup manis, for example, right? Who did you write it for in mind? Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the, the story of, of course, published in English, so I had a, an audience that was more familiar with English in mind. And, but I do have uh, also... Um, the, the idea that the reader would be a Malay person who's also well versed in English, a Singaporean Malay person, uh, but also someone from who doesn't know Malay culture at all. So I'm hoping that someone who doesn't know Malay culture at all or is not familiar would see that this story is so fantastical that they would think twice about the content of the story. Uh, and so when I say Santani to Setan, uh, I hope that they see this through. Uh, in, in a way of rethinking what, I'm, uh, what, what this sentence actually means. Of course, I was thinking along the lines of very real uh, you know, advert, no, campaigns by the government that tries to uh, look at certain aspects of Malay culture as being the problem. I mean, the drug campaign, right? Drug awareness campaign, Dada itu haram, right? Dada is a, 
uh, haram forbidden basically. in Islam. Yeah, per- impermissible. As if we didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, and 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 also health data about showcasing so showcasing uh, Malays being the least healthy and stuff like that. So I was playing on that idea of categorization, data uh, use, and the interpretation that come with it. Uh, and you know, it's it's about the methodology of it all. But if you look at the story, you will see that the individuals in the story, uh, Ali, Tujo, etc., etc., uh, they they uh, they do very horrible things. Uh, but they also have elements of uh, uh, about them that is not as horrible. Like for example, Ali was thinking about the Me Too campaign right at the start. Right at the same time, also in the end, it turns out that he is you know, capable of committing the most horrible, atrocious acts, right? And so, I, I was trying to draw attention that the, the monster is not the individual, but actually the, the, the system itself. Like, these, these individuals are part of a, of a machinery, and the issue is we don't change the, the individual, we change the machine, I think. Hmm, okay, so going back to your earlier point about the fact that a non malay audience would still appreciate it uh, beyond, I guess it's like Diana. I know you watch Korean dramas, right? It's like watching Korean dramas. You get entertained, but actually, there's a deeper layer sometimes that we don't get because we are not born into the culture. So okay, that's like extra bonus for Malays, right? You really you get 13.5 stories or 14.5 since we have the cover, also, right? And I think there's so much subversion in your stories, also in your story, also, and actually in all three stories in a way, right? All three of you here, including Hassan there, right? Of the secret and profane, and I think in in Diana, yours is the offering, right? Offering and the, the, the nasi, which is in, which is not nasi, pulut. It's coloured, right? And now you know it's interesting that your story originated. I mean, Ulek Mayang is in Trungganu, right? The the origin of of the song slash ritual. And now Trungganu is like one of the most religiously conservative uh, Malaysian past. Yeah, and anyway, we were discussing like who's the political party in power. If I'm not wrong, it is still past, but uh, but ne- nevertheless, it's really one of the most conservative religious, conservatively religious states in Malaysia. But of course, people always find ways around it, right? And and in Nazri's story, I had to read about like Malaikat fucking it up, and 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 the fact that the murderer is Tujo is is, is Tujo female. Then Ali talks about Me Too messaging, right? But who's really committing the murder? Tujo or Ali? So. Maybe as a final question to all three panelists before I open it up to the floor, right? Uh, did you, is this line between sacred and profane something you were thinking about, or the fact that when I write, I want to transgress something, or is it just, just flows out? You know, is, is there that, that, that burden of like, I'm writing from a minority perspective, therefore, I need to be more experimental, or is it being a minority gives you more room to be experimental in a way? Because Already you exist in a, in a smaller space. Therefore, what's there left to lose? You know? Hassan goes last. Yeah, Hassan goes last. Even though the title of my story is called Transgression, I really did not see it as a essentially transgressive story. Like, yes, there is... Um, Hassan goes last because I'm lagging. <laughs> okay, thank you, Hassan. Um, so, I mean, there is this element of like soul border crossing, but in terms of like the speculative, I think it's actually very inherent in the literary tradition in, in like Malay literature and not just like our literature, but just the stories that we grew up with, the ones that are disseminated through oral tradition, our folk tales. It's you know, I was thinking of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. He's a Latin American writer, and he's usually categorized under magical realism. And he's a Colombian writer. And he has said that actually he does not consider his writings to be magical realism because it's just how, um, like, this is just like how reality is thought about and how it is described and how it is written about in Latin America. And, you know, like, for example, there's this story, 100 Years of Solitude, where a, a child dies and then the blood travels and flows and then goes upstairs and travels around, like, the street and then reaches the mother. And then that's how the mother finds out, right? And I was thinking, like, actually, it's, it's, it's kind of similar in, in our 
tradition. That, uh, sorry, I know I'm going very long way, but no, I was just thinking okay. about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's very this element of like exploring and I guess the, why we think of it as transgressive is because we live in a time where our way of understanding, the framework of understanding is very delineated. There is this very strict divide between like what is real and what is not real, what is spiritual and what is provable, what is science and what is not. But I think for in Malay culture, that was not really our norm and not what was dominant for a very long time. And I think even in the present, we don't live our lives like that. Most humans don't live our lives um, in a very strict way, right? Like in terms of how we are categorized, how we experience our reality. So I did not, to, to answer the question, I did not really seek to be transgressive. I think I was just writing to me a very normal human story. And the story of um, a human and a bunyan, I was just talking to Fazila just now. It's a, she said it's a very Malay story. Indeed, it's a story that has been written about many times. Like, it has been written out in like films, in in like TV shows. Like when I told my mom I'm writing this, like, oh, someone has really written about it. Like, I watched a TV show about it. And I was like, yeah, I know, but I want to write my own version, right? And <laughs> yeah, so I just I feel like I'm just participating in this like larger stream, a very fun stream, a wonderful stream that is very rich. It does not really have such strict delineations. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the insight. Nazri, you want to add? Yeah. Yeah. So when I think about the division between sacred and profane, the story that really jumps out at me is not my own story, but uh, actually Noor's story, right? And Noor has two stories in there, uh, which is great because the, when I first read uh, Noor's submission, she wrote about uh, a, a kind of retelling of the, is a kind of the myth of creation. It, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm kind of like an Abrahamic myth of creation, but I see it also as Islamic and also quite Malay. Uh, so, I, and I, so I was quite so impressed by that story that we had a conversation about possibly because she wrote about the beginning, maybe she can also write about the end. And she said that, yeah, uh, yeah, already have a story like that. So I thought that would be a, a nice book end to the start and the end of it. Yeah, the duality. So, yeah. so I, I, you know, that, that was really the most, uh, you know, for me, I don't know whether that was a... a, a purposefully transgressive. We, we have to ask the writer uh, herself, but uh, certainly that jump up at me as, 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 you know, toggling between the two, which is so great. Yeah, so I'm very thanks for that. Huh? She's also here today. Yeah. yeah, I really like the duality, beginning and end, literally also. Uh, finally, Hassan, and while we wait for the five second lag, right, maybe we can load the Slido already. So uh, we're taking questions on Slido today. So you can submit it there. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so yeah, Hassan, uh, how about you? Secret, profane, transgressive, intentional. Yeah, so the slido, can we have? Ah, yes, yes. I think when I wrote, when, when I wrote this, uh, it was not intentional. Uh, there was no no sense of transgression, uh, uh, transgression also. I just want to write a very fun, engaging story. So, but then when I were to read again at this current climate, uh, with with the use with the more usage of technology, uh, you have Zoom, you have Microsoft Teams. You have home-based learning, and we are seeing that with more involvement of technology, uh, people think that it's it's much simpler. But then they forget that the other end, we are going to have fatigue, technology uh, technology fatigue. Uh, I've spent meeting and conducting classes from morning to evening, and at the end of it, I just want to get away from the computer, just get away from the screen. Yeah, so so that, that's from me, lah. Okay, thank you, Hassan. We have 13 minutes left. <laughs> yeah, flew by, right? <laughs> what? Yeah, it's one hour, Diana. <laughs> so we have questions on... Yeah, thank you for saying I'm very engaging and indirectly. <laughs> but, okay, we have questions on Slido. Uh, it's voting system, right? 
we we doing democratic. Okay lah, we doing democratic. Feudal days are over. So maybe the first one. Is, is that the most highly voted question? Uh, yeah. Why do you think there is so little Malay representation in singlet written in English? Le anyone can answer. So, Nazri Diana, five second like Hassan also can. Don't worry, we will wait. You academic. <laughs> I mean, um, it's very hard to answer why. The lecture, Anas, this requires no, a two-hour no, lecture. Just, uh, I, I think uh, Malay writers uh, who have uh, engaged more with writing in the original than... But, I, you see, without a sociological study, it's hard to say why there, there is a lack of representation. But, uh, but I, I just think that uh, the, there was... It's emerging. More and more Malay writers are writing in English. It's a, maybe a, the result of our bilingual policy that even Malay, uh, Malays today are going, uh, you know, uh, a bit like even my nephew, I guess, is, you know, has problems with, uh, you know, speak English more at home than speak Malay. So I think we will see more and more works emerging in English. It's not that there are no representation. There, are, there could be more. And I think increasingly there will be. Uh, but I think the majority of Malay writings, the, the richness of tradition comes within the, you know, the Malay language kind of sastra in, in Singapore. Maybe just to add, there's also the, you know, book selling, whether we like it or not, it's a capitalist endeavor, right? I mean, in some ways, because you need to sell the books, you don't sell the books, then you don't publish. It's a chicken and egg, right? Which came first? Do the writer need to write first or the market needs to exist first? And I think books like Sufyan Hakim's The Minorities, have you read it? My gosh! When? You know, what is that? It's a roller coaster. There's like Jewish philosophy, there's Hantu at Changi Hospital, there's a Pontiana who's the main protagonist. You know, when I first read the book, I was like, apa ni? But it's, it's brilliant, right? It's brilliant. And then you ask yourself, would a non malay enjoy this book? I think, you know, there's, there's, my answer is yes lah. Who wouldn't want to read about Pontiana, right? And, and you know, something that I noticed this seventh month, right? Is that, you know, we always see seventh month, Hungry Ghost Festival, it's a Chinese thing. I was at the MRT. And I swear, I heard an auntie narrate to her friend about a ghost, like a ghostly encounter with an ustad. So in some ways, right, and it was during seven months, it, it felt like there was a, and I joined a cycling group, right, okay, random. I joined a cycling group, and it was like the Malays were in on it too during seventh month. So it's kind of like, it's not state-sponsored racial harmony, but you know, when my Chinese friends say, oh, sorry, I don't go cycling during seven months, it felt like, it felt like Malay hantu stories also were like more active. And it ties in the narrative of like spirits being stronger. So maybe that's the direction of that. Yeah? Who knows? Okay. Uh, I mean, I think, I don't, I don't think it's just like Malays, right? I think in general, minorities have very poor representation in the Singapore literature scene. I think only kind of like recently we are seeing more of them. And even it's not just about like just pure representation or crude representation. It's also like what kind of stories can be appreciated or like what stories are elevated. And so I think the nature of the, the industry also plays a part. But then, of course, that's a very long conversation. Lah. Yeah, yeah that somebody uh, asked question Twitter style. Lucky I follow Twitter even though I don't have an account. But <laughs> it, it got like two... Hassan want to say anything about Oh, yeah. yeah, Hassan, while I figure this Twitter thing out, do you want to say something about why is there so little Malay representation in Sing Lit written in English? And it's an interesting question for Hassan to answer too because he writes in Malay. Yeah. Thank you, audience, for being patient. I think I agree with what Dr. Nazri says. Uh, as we see more uh, youngsters, as we see more youngsters uh, conversing in more in English rather than Malay, I feel I, I feel that we will see more writers uh, writing in English. Uh, for me, I. I primarily write in Malay because uh, not that confident writing English. I think my my grammar was all over the place. Uh, my O level English, I think I've got D seven if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so that, that that's that's why I, I write more in Malay. But uh, I, I I agree I agree with Dr. Nazrul. We we are hoping to see more Malay writers. 
uh, either writing Malay or perhaps you can get more translators, Malay translators, to translate Malay works into English. I think that's an excellent... Is he done? Huh? I think he's done, right? Okay, I think that's really an excellent point because you did translate um, some of the words and they translated really well because I've read them in Malay. Right? So for me, who has read them in both, it's, it's interesting to see how they change, but also how they remain the same. So maybe Nazri, you want to comment on that slightly, that translation process? Yeah, so I, I try to translate, uh, to try to maintain the essence of the text, and sometimes I don't translate word for word, like, basically. I don't go for linguistic uh, equivalents, I go for the essence of the text. Yeah, so I, I don't know if it's sometimes, I mean, it can be controversial, uh, but uh, that's the way I go about doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask him how does he feel seeing his story translated. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah, Hassan, how do you feel reading your own story in Malay and English? What do you think was lost? But what do you think was preserved or enhanced maybe even through translation? I think, I think when, when I read it in English, it, 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 I, was, I was very, very, very excited about it. Uh, it was nicely written. The heart of the story is there. Uh, as when you have to compare it with, uh, with Malay, there's not much uh, difference to it. The, the, the main motif, the character, main character is there. Uh, the, the essence of what I want to bring forward to tell the audience is captured nicely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nazri, for that. Oh, are we going back to the doctor thing now? Okay. But anyway, following... Oh, you have a thumbs up from another... Sorry, you translated, is it? Yeah, uh, Pasida, who also writes a, a story the, in... Is here. The chip, right? Yeah. The chip, yeah. Yeah, the chip, yeah. So, so, I mean, we could also ask the same question of you. Uh, and I don't know if we can transgress the boundaries here to us. <laughs> cannot, Pasida. cannot. Later, cannot SMM. Lie, yeah. Later, we... That, that boundary, I cannot... Because what might have financial repercussions? <laughs> <laughs> so, we might do that in she, another... She said, question, thumbs up. Yeah. yeah. I enjoyed the story so much and I wouldn't have known it was written in Malay. It felt like watching I Am Robot, but the Malay version, because the Dato is the evil one, right? It's like Malay so Oprah slash, you know. Yeah, maybe Hollywood's not so different after all. Okay, the next question that has the highest number of upvotes. Um, following the earlier discussion on the story of Oleg Mayang, the Islamization movement has curbed the practice and ritual of Oleg Mayang in Trangano. Yeah, this is true. Uh, Twitter threat, Twitter Right, number two, where it's all over the place. Yes. Do you know of other examples where the adoption of Islam may have led to the erosions or watering down of Malay pre-Islamic stories and rituals or narratives? And can we preserve or revive some of these narratives in modern Malay literature? I think this also requires a lecture by itself, lah, two hours. But, but yeah. abstract, abstract, yeah. Diana. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, there's like Ulit Mayang isn't the only ritual, right? So there's really quite a lot of other um, rituals and dances that are under threat and in fact I, 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 I because like I mean I'm not Malaysian so I'm not as tuned into like the politics but I really wonder if like the presence of like these rituals actually um, give political parties like pass uh, more incentive I guess to, to campaign there but anyway uh, yeah there, there are a lot of these um, rituals that are under threat and not just like uh, practices but I think a certain way of relating to the world or how we see things like um, how do I say uh, like I mean the, in, in, in Malay culture from what I understand I'm not an expert so I feel nervous answering this question it's okay there's no anthropologist here in this room yeah. today <laughs> so, yeah free license Diana okay so like from what I understand uh, like that our I guess our relationship to nature and the land before this was a lot more different, it's a lot more tuned in and then um, things like uh, believing that elements of nature are alive, that they, they have their own sort of like essence or spirit or smanga or whatever and so you would, you would give a certain sort of respect to them but then of course this is seen as like un-Islamic now and 
even like uh, my mom often says these kinds of things because like, I find it very interesting so I talk about it constantly but she said oh, oh yeah but that's like because pe Malays in the past they were not Muslim so they didn't know better so there's this sort of like um, rewriting of what our ways of being and relating to the world what it was actually that it's actually wrong and, and, and that now we are on the right path and so for me, I think that's one of the sadder things. Like even if you were not to believe that these elements of nature have their own spiritual essence and that they, they are alive, I think it's very valuable to see the world in that light. Yeah. Then we wouldn't lose 97% of our primary rainforest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, climate change, climate crisis. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I see, you know, my minister, when he go door knocking, I ask him, why all the forests in Sembawang kena cut down? Then what did he answer? He uh, need to develop. Need to develop. Uh, he say, like, uh, now young people like to do things. <laughs> we cannot, like, sit down at the kampung, do nothing. He said that. I, was, I don't think people Seriously, in the kampung last... Yeah, and then I said, I don't think people in the kampung last time do nothing. Yeah, and I don't... Then he nervous, then he start walking back. <laughs> the Homer Simpson meme. Right? Okay, uh, Mak Yong Kede is also a very good example of a ritual that, that almost disappeared, you know. And it's no uh, coincidence that Mak Yong, Kede, eh, Mak Yong is in Kelantan. She's also one of, also by, uh, controlled by PAS, also one of the more, re most religiously conservative states in Malaysia. That's interesting. Mm. So Mak Yong, they cannot perform that Mak Yong dance there at home, right? Mm. So I actually saw a Mak Yong dance but in KL. Yeah. So these troops actually have to go to other states to be able to perform their dances. Yeah. yeah. So can our narratives reclaim? I say, why the heck not? There was a really good Mak Yong uh, performance in um, Taman Warisan in Singapore. And then um, the practitioner actually said that he, and he actually modernized the story. And then the story was actually about the tension of not being able to perform Mak Yong. So it's like meta, meta, meta. It's like, you know, so many levels, right? But he said that he has not been able to perform this at that time right, in Malaysia. Now, that's, now, now it's preserved under some cultural heritage. So, you know, that's the way they circumvent, right? So they're like, oh, this is culture, not religion. So that's also a very smart way of getting around it. Yeah. So in Singapore, the Kuda Kepang, I think. The Kuda yeah. Kepang yep. kind of like in the past when, you know, there were performances. Uh, I remember growing up at Aljunet Crescent, you know, watching a performance of the Kuda Kepang performer eating glass, actually. Mm -hmm. So that was really quite interesting. I mean, it was uh, as a young child, I saw that. Um, I, in, a, in a ethos newsletter, I talk about exorcism that I actually attended for because I was asthmatic as a, as a young boy and you know, my parents thought that maybe we've tried Western medicine, why Ooh. don't we try an exorcism? Oh, wow. Okay. And then I actually saw like a very, uh, the exorcist kind of thing unveiling right before. Uh, it really kind of traumatized me a little bit like, as a child and maybe that's why I'm so you know, drawn to dark stories or something, I'm not sure. But, uh, Did it cure your asthma, the most important thing? Yeah, yeah, I don't have asthma anymore now. <laughs> wow. Wow. So maybe it did. Well, better, I guess, you yeah. just needed to be shocked out of your system. <laughs> Could be. <yeah. laughs> okay, so final question, maybe you can end off with this. What would you like to see from Ishan? What would you like to see next in Singapore, Malay spec fix? I think the what continuities can we find with spec fix in Malaysia, Indonesia? I think you covered that in your forward, in your afterward, right? Yeah, about Eka Kurniawan. So, right? so Ishan, buy the book if you have not. Or buy and distribute to more, buy and distribute to more people. Yeah, so... But yeah, maybe what do you like to see next in Singapore, Malay Spec Fix? You think it's a nice way to end off, you know? Like looking to the future, what do you wish more of? What do you want more? More space, more more editors? <laughs> um more translations, I guess, actually. Yeah. Because actually um I think it's very natural, like I mentioned earlier, to the tradition. I was thinking of like uh, Muhammad Latif Muhammad. I really like his this one book, I forgot the Malay title, uh, but the translated one was The Widower. What's the Malay title? Do you remember? I've been translated it, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, I've been translated. Yeah. But anyway, it's a, for me, it's a very good book because it talked about things like, um, I mean, the, the main character is like a political dissident who was jailed for his political activities as a leftist in the past and then he, he, he's grieving his wife and his grieving is so intense that it defies the laws of the natural world and then he prays constantly and then there's this like the, the burial area becomes alive, the, 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 the wind talks to him, the rain talks to him, the flowers talk to him and then 
So it's a kind of like, in a sense, I don't know if that's considered speculative fiction, but I think it's, 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 it's considered that, and it's like decades ago. So I think I would like to see, for me, like, at least like more translations so that um, there is more sort of like engagement with those who write in our mother tongue. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess, more engagement with the, our own stories like in our own tradition, yeah. Okay, Nazri? Yeah, I, I actually agree. And I think actually like part of the story, like Faisal Tara, part of the idea is that this is part of a long line of uh, richness of tradition that goes all the way back to Sejarah Melayu, uh, but it's expressed in that very ethnic, I mean, that to answer that question of what's different about spec fic in Singapore Malay narrative compared to Mal Malaysia and Indonesia is for the simple fact that the, the residents of Singapore who are of Malay ethnicity are, do not belong in the majority. So there are certain aspects of that that uh, you know, professes itself in these stories, uh, like in, invisible glass ceilings, that, uh, the, you know, the need to conform to neat little boxes. I've mentioned this as well. But there are also, I mean, I mentioned all the negative things in the book, but there are also positive things that came out from the story, this notion of care for others, you know. Mm -hmm. A, a sense of building of solidarity among uh, the downtrodden stuff that I see. That, that recognition, that tradition is not all bad, right? There is a richness to it and you, we can, you know, uh, enhance that. So I, I would like to see, uh, you know, more writings in this area, but of course it's not up to me. This will have to be organic. But uh, going back to see some of the modern Malay literature that do engage in uh, speculative fiction, mm -hmm. uh, read large, for example, I actually translated more stories from uh, from... Uh, uh, Hassan and more stories from Farihan and Farihan was challenging because he plays with word quite a bit yeah, like yeah. for example tukang tunjuk telunjuk telunjuk yeah, yeah. I, I, how do I alliterate that into an English you know and try to you know translate the beauty of that that, that sentence that phrase right it was hard so so stuff like that you know um, yeah so I think like engage with the modern Malay literature that shows there's a kind of continuity or a precursor to this. Okay, I'm so sorry we don't have time for Hassan's five second leg, Hassan, because we have to have a hard stop now. But as an ending, maybe then, as in Bani's story, Isolated Future Number Two, MacRitchie Tree Tops, humans always find a way. So, thank you for being with us here today. Please get a copy of this excellent volume. Thank you, Ethos, and we hope to see you physically again soon, maybe in the next launch of the next volume of Singapura Pura. Thank you, everyone.